Hello, Hi. where are the undertones? Well, we're two of them. And, we're, yeah, and you're watching Winkball. Winkball.com. Winkball.com. I've seen extremes, so hard to beat. Every time she walks by. Well, yes, thank you for taking the time to speak to Winkball.com. We're very happy that you asked. Yes, thank absolutely. you very much. We're very happy to have you. And um, we're happy that you're happy. <laughs> we could be happy. We're all happy, yes. <laughs> For those of our viewers who are lacking in a good music education, could you just introduce yourself please and tell us what your role is in the band? You go first, Paul. Well, my name is Paul McLoone and I am the lead singer. Well, I have been since 1999. The original lead singer of the Undertones was, of course, Fergus Sharkey. And when we reformed, uh, we just, well, they decided not, not to use him, but they decided to use me instead. So I've been doing yeah. it. It was only ever meant to be for one gig and then it ended up 12 years later here we are. But there you go. So I'm Paul. This is Michael. Hello, I'm Michael Bradley. I'm bass player with the Undertones. I co-wrote My Perfect Cousin. He did. And that's about all. And I was one of the gang of four that decided not to ask Fergal. And he says, no, don't ask Fergal. Get Paul. He's better. Well, so, I was going to ask you about that. You reformed <coughs> with Paul on vocals in 1999. Who got the ball rolling on that and how did everyone else feel when the call came in? I think it was Billy, our drummer, who's behind most balls whenever it comes to rolling things. He's, um, he was very friendly with a band called the Saw Doctors. This is the shortened version. Mm -hmm. And the Saw Doctors occasionally would do Teenage Kicks as, a, as an encore. And they asked Billy and myself to come on stage. And, you know, Billy did the drums and I played bass while they did Teenage Kicks. It was great crack. And then 1999, the uh, Galway Arts Festival, which is kind of a big deal in Ireland, they asked would myself and Billy uh, do the same with the Saw Doctors. And also Billy then asked John and Damien. At this stage, that petrol motion had broken up, so John and Damien were both free. And to my surprise, the two of them says, yes, why not? So, four of us, and they never, <laughs> even the Saw Doctors never asked Fergal, because they knew Fergal wouldn't be interested. So, we, uh, we played in Galway at that. Uh, we, we did a big show with him, and then we played in a small pub in Galway. Just the four of us. Mm -hmm. Didn't, we, we only remembered about seven hundred of songs. And we had various people singing. A guy from the Saw Doctors was singing. A guy from the crowd came up and sang <laughs> with We says, do you know any undertone songs? And the boy says, I know Wednesday week. I met that boy. <laughs> and he did know Wednesday week. He couldn't sing though. No. He was awful. What's it's called called Cuser. Like that. What's it called? Cuser. I met him in a pub in, in, in uh, Smithfield in Dublin. Cuser? Oh, Aye. Yeah. And he sang Wednesday week. Uh, he's, he's kind of part of the reason I ended up in the Undertones. Mm -hmm. well, well, it was all part of the same thing. All right. Yeah, because I'm going to if ask you, you how, 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 how you ended up on the uh, Undertones. I'd love to know who actually rang you. Uh, Billy did. Billy and I were in a band while we were all doing, while everybody was doing different things after the Undertones, the Petrels, and Mickey was doing a couple mm -hmm. of things. Ended, we, Mickey and I both ended up working. Um, in radio, um, but I also had a band and a few other kind of things going on with Billy. We we ma we managed bands for a period, and we had a recording studio for a period, and we just and did any various things together. And um, Billy rang me. I had just moved to Dublin. My radio career had taken me to Dublin, where I still am with Today FM. Mm -hmm. And uh, Billy rang me out of the blue and said, um, "Are you up for this? We're reforming." I thought he meant our band. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "No, we're no, we're not. I'm the, I'm, no, I just got out of that." Um, and then he, he explained that it was the undertones and it was very, you know, it was very, very it was great to be asked. Um, and it was also, at that time, a very finite thing. It was mm. the opening of uh, a place in Derry called the Nerve Centre, which is a multimedia uh, kind of operation. Um, they do all sorts of things, very creative, very kind of cool, techy kind of place. Mm -hmm. And part of it is uh, a live venue. And um, it was an extension of a thing, an initiative in Derry from the 90s called the Northwest Musicians Collective, which we were all big supporters of. So um, obviously we were very keen to do that, but that was meant to be it. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it kind of just, we just enjoyed it so much and it went, it went over so well. Because in Derry, um, shall we say Derry, people are quite forthright in terms of whether or not they think someone's a good idea. Yes. So, you know, um, if, if it had been like basically shit, we'd have been, we'd have been told as much in short order. But, they re you know, everybody had a great night, a great couple of nights actually. Mm -hmm. But the big risk for us is that we didn't, we'd, we'd says yes, we'd do it and we'd ask Paul. We never actually tried it. That's right. <laughs> we hadn't rehearsed or anything. Well, no change there. And we didn't have a plan B. You know, it was not like we had we had a, a list of people who were the only one we would we considered was Paul. You know, there was no one else. Like. That was high praise indeed. Well, it was fair. It was because we knew him too. Yeah, he was good crack. Yeah. It was it was great to be asked. But yeah, I mean, as Mickey says, I kind of I'd gotten to know most of, apart from Damien because Damien um, was still living in London and and uh, I hadn't really ever really met Damien. No um, one knows Damien. <laughs> 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 mysterious um, brother. 
He is indeed, but the rest of them, I mean, Billy obviously, Billy and I went back a long way, Michael and I went back quite a bit with the, the radio thing, and John as well, just from actually the collective and the music scene in Derry, I'd gotten to know him quite well as well, so it, was, it wasn't, you know, for me it wasn't a, a, a kind of a personally daunting thing in terms of the personalities involved, I knew I'd get on with people, yeah. but it was, you know, how the crowd would, would react was a, yeah, big Big, ner big nervous factor around right, you. Yeah. And, and how did it go? It was brilliant. I mean, it was kind of funny because it was the first instance. We've, we've grown used to it now, but it was the first time we'd seen the phenomenon of the of the, of the, the big kind of men, shall we say, who were thicker around the middle and a little thinner on the top than they had been. <laughs> um, sort of pogoing their, 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 their heads off, basically. Uh, it was kind of... It was, on one level, it was brilliant, you know, because they were, they were just reliving their youth and that was kind of great, you know. Um, and I don't think anybody ever expected to see any um, sort of iteration of the undertones back on stage ever again. So it was a kind of a, a big occasion, actually, at the time. I never thought we would ever do it again, you know. And I wasn't really interested in doing it again. I never, it was never a burning ambition or anything, you know, but it just seemed like a good idea at the time. Yeah. And, and of course, this is before everybody started reforming. Well, yeah, we'll talk about that in a minute. Because um, you're obviously here at the O2 Academy in Liverpool tonight mm -hmm. as part of the 35th anniversary of True Confessions uh, tour. How different is it being on tour now compared to the old days? I take it travels a step up from Turgle's TV repair van that you oh, see around. Yes, we're not in the back of a radio rentals van anymore. <laughs> no, it was. Uh, it's, it's a sky it's, van. Man. It's very different. <laughs> <laughs> It's a hover van. You know. No, it's different because it's only lasts about three days at a time. You know, normally we would have done, we would have played three or four weeks uh, with maybe one day off a week. Mm -hmm. But now we just because we've so many other things happening, we've decided right we we'll take Wednesday or Thursday and Friday off. That means we get four days in a row: Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, so they're shorter, shorter bursts. Uh, so which is great because there's less uh, less opportunity to get on each other's nerves. You know, mm -hmm. nice and sort of short bursts of, of amity. Oh, yeah. Which is good. Yeah, yeah. that's good. I mean not uh, that we not no. that we get under that much. But you know it can get yeah, but we I remember we did uh, we did a tour uh, a few years ago to personally for me just to kind of bleat pathetically uh, like a main singer uh, or like a lead singer is that the voice goes after after I mean, I remember we did a tour um, where we played, I think it was five or six nights in a row, and I remember being backstage at a, at a show in Wales and just sort of oh, wow, yeah. lying, kind of wondering if I was actually going to be able to sing. And it was like, I get nervous anyway, mm -hmm. going on stage, I get, I get quite nervous before a show, and I was, oh, it was, that was a really horrible feeling because I was just really in bad form and really, really worried and just sick with nerves and didn't think I'd be able to sing. So kind of doing, the sh doing three or four shows, and that's it, and then taking a break is, is the way to go for me, yeah. just physically. I just I don't know how Fergal did six or seven or eight nights in a row, I honestly don't know. He, used, he, he usually sat on the stage or not <laughs> on the stage, he didn't know. But singing is really hard, that's what yeah. I realise now. Singing is really difficult mm -hmm. to do, you know, very physical. Bass playing, all you do is you use basically about three muscles, you know, in your hand. But singing's probably, that's proper work. Proper work, so. It is. <laughs> thinking you're playing the whole of the first album in its entirety tonight. In sequence? Yes. In sequence, are. fantastic. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of mention of girls in your early albums, mm -hmm. the first two albums in particular. Uh, were they written more or less together and I take it you weren't having much success with the ladies at this point. Well actually but at that stage we weren't doing too bad. Mm -hmm. But it took until we were about nineteen years old to get a girlfriend, you know, which is quite long. Was that after Top of the Pops or before? With me it was after actually. Literally the, the night, the night after. The the night. Night. <laughs> no, that's odd. Yeah. yeah, it was Annie Nightingale. No, <laughs> uh, no the, the, uh, there, there was about seven days, the summer of seven days, whenever we'd recorded Teenage Kicks, but it hadn't come out. That's when various people started to get girlfriends and so on, you know, which was great. We discovered girls. Um, but the, the, the thing about the songs, all our songs, all the songs in the first LP were obviously written before we recorded the first LP, you know, but then after that we had nothing. It's not like we had a whole pile of songs, we had nothing left. So there was a very quick, um, very quick session of, right, we need more songs because we're going to do another. Yeah, because there's LP. 12, 14 tracks on the first two albums, isn't there? Uh, yeah, there's 14 on the, or 13 or 14 on the first and 15 the second, I think. Because, yes, because it was subtitled 15 Rocking Homedingers. But it was very interesting recording Hypnotise because halfway through we ran out of songs. <laughs> you know, we went into the studio and we were booked in for three weeks or something. And we obviously didn't do, 
a check and see how many songs we got, you know? It's like we assume I have one here somewhere. And after we recorded seven songs and we rattled through them. Right, what do we do next? I don't know. We have I seem to have that. Yes. <laughs> I seem to have left my songs in my other coat. So uh, I remember the producer said I could get he mentioned some other songwriter. I could get him to write some songs for you. We just we we didn't hit him, but we, yeah. we, we stopped out. short. We stopped short, and we all went home. Lucky it was near Christmas, so we went home and we came back in with about six or seven songs. Santa brought three. Mm. No, he was good to you that year. Yeah. Wasn't he? Santa was brought my perfect cousin. <laughs> so no, that was that was. Uh, when did I tell you that? No, you were saying about whether we record, wrote all the songs mm -hmm. the whole time, and we also had Gary. John always wrote Gary's in the titles because it just. That's what people did. It's a pop thing. Yeah, and also very much of your age. She was you know, young males. He still does. John <laughs> still writes. A, he still writes a lot of songs. We, I mean, we've got a whole bunch of new songs, and one of them's got mm -hmm. girls in the title. And, mm -hmm. and you know, the last two albums had, I think, well, not like the one before the last one had a girl song in it as well. I think it's just a. John has a certain sensibility, a certain kind of songwriting sensibility, and writing songs about girls is kind of very. I think it's a, it's a father Jack thing. <laughs> John sits in the, in the house every so often and just shouts girls <laughs> I'd like to see that Yeah, he does that and then he gets a guitar and he puts them to puts them exactly what happens Right, with all your years of touring behind you, would you what would you say has been your best Spinal Tap moment? Because you must have had some over the years oh, I don't need that. Our best Spinal Tap moment Some of them are too, too disturbing to talk about it <laughs> You know? <laughs> They really are. They all involve Billy, do they? Kind of. Mm. I think Billy came on with any sticks one though. <laughs> Fingers. Yeah. Um, are you talking spinal tap as in fighting? No, as in things lost, like absurd. Getting lost, thing, yeah. absurd things going wrong. Absurd things going wrong. That you just wouldn't factor. Yeah. Um, not turned up at the wrong venue. We're getting flashbacks here. <laughs> That's what you had yeah, got. I used to apologise. We played a few places that, that turned out to be the wrong venue. Eh? We, should, <laughs> we really yeah. shouldn't have been there. There's, there's, we have a byword for kind of trouble or a, 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 a bad mood, but it, it involves the name of a place in Northern Ireland, so I'm not going to say yeah. it. Right. But we have this kind of byword. Whenever we, something we say it goes each bad, other. yeah, yeah. we say the name of this. That's a code and word. It, and everyone goes, what do you write? But having said that, I remember we played in Spain. We did a wee short tour of Spain about five years ago. And we did, you know, we did Madrid and Barcelona and so on, the places you've heard of. And then we, and then we did Bilbao, which you've heard of. And then you go on over further west. And we, it was like driving uphill and down Dale. And we arrived at this town that no one had ever heard of. I can't even remember it. So. And it was, it was like a small town stuck in the past, you know. And we were at this, we went in and put the gear up. And we did the sound check, and it was a theatre, and it was death. You know, there was nobody around it, no seats. And we were going, what, what did we say? <laughs> Why are we here? Why are we here? And it was brilliant. Yeah. It was, I think what happened was, it was a university town, it was a university near, and then suddenly this place was packed with all these cool Spanish people. Mm -hmm. And it was just a great night. It was turned out to be a great night, as they often do, when you have yeah. a bad feeling, you turn out to be very wrong. I almost missed uh, quite a big show in Guildford. There's oh. a festival yeah. uh, in, there, in there called Guildfest, and we we were lucky enough to be asked to play it along with the likes of Madness and the Stranglers, and mm. you know it was a big lineup, mm. and uh, it was a big gig fairly early on in the whole my, my involvement with the band. It was a Saturday morning, and I had been out the night before uh, mm -hmm. in Dublin Fail. with a visiting friend of mine from from Derry who I won't name for legal reasons and um, yeah I slept in and it's the only time I've ever done it but of course I now have a reputation for missing flights but it's actually the only time I ever missed a flight No, you missed a train once in Germany uh, that's not a plane though is it <laughs> trains, boats, planes as Billy I Jane think you'll said. find yeah, but there was no harm done in Germany no that's true but in Guildford I missed the plane and a real panic a real panic <laughs> thing I panic set in and I rang our, our manager Barry I said I, listen I'm, I'm not not kidding, before you start the whole you're joking thing, I'm not joking, I've missed the plane. Um, he said, okay, and I could hear Barry fighting back the panic on the phone. Going, okay, okay, go to the airport, go to the airport, just go, just go, go now. And so I did, I literally ran out the door and, and got to the airport as quickly as I could and then Barry, God bless him, was making frantic plans to get me on a different plane and got me on a different plane, got over, got to the nearest airport, whatever, Barry was there with a car, this hired Mercedes, we broke yeah. every speed limit in the county 
uh, got to Guildford, literally drove in, and the yeah. whole way in, Barry's answering, fielding calls on the mobile from the promoter guy going, where are you? Where are you? Uh, yeah, we had like, I can't remember I was talking to the promoter, I said, oh no, he's, Paul's over there. It's just over there. And he knew he was. <laughs> when I got there, yes. everybody was on stage. I swear to God, this is a bit spinal tap. I actually, literally, the car, the, the, the Mercedes pulls up at the side of the stage, at the steps. I get out of the Mercedes, I go up the steps, I walk on the stage, I start singing. Because everybody was already on stage, they couldn't stall them any longer. They were thinking about maybe doing the show just without us. Uh, um, that's, yeah, I'm not particularly proud of it. We could, have pretended, you were, we could have pretended you were there, but you, you had the power of invisibility. <laughs> He's our magic singer. What do you mean you can't see Paul? He must be on drugs if he can't see Yeah, him. or you're, you're, you're a bad child if you can't That's see right. Only the good children can see Yeah. yeah. So um, that was a good one. That was Tabasque, yeah. Yeah, great. Right. Scary. Well, yeah, I, get, I still have nightmares about it. Oh, I know. That was the worst place we ever played. Oh, don't name it though. That's not fair. No, so you're right. It's not fair. It's not fair, no. but there's good people there. Yeah. Very briefly before, there's currently a wave of punk bands back out on the road mm -hmm. at the moment. Stranglers, Damned, Sham 69, Stiff Little Fingers, of course. Mm -hmm. um, do you see a similarity now with the late 70s, early 80s in the with the country in the grip of recession? And it's now the right time for a punk revival, or are today's generation not motivated enough to care? I, no, it's, I don't think that's fair. I think there, there I don't think there's it's any similarity to 1979 musically. Because then we were still a couple of years after punk, and it was this is a huge new thing, you know, all these all these bands coming up. Whether it was to do with the economic situation, I don't really know. I think it's, it's more to do just with the formation of the Sex Pistols being mm -hmm. so good and the Ramones being so good. Uh, I think people now are are motivated to do things, you know. Um, and I think the reason that all, all those punk bands coming back has nothing to do with with whether punk's alive or not. It's just bands are realist. This is good. You know, it's just out the road, let's get yeah. back out. I'm only 48, I can do this. <laughs> that's right. Um, <laughs> no, but that's the thing, I mean, back then it was like, oh, well, you know, if you were 30, you were considered, mm. well, do you know mm. what I mean? And that's kind of the way young people look at people who aren't as young as they are. Yeah. And, Whereas, and rightly so. And rightly so. And when you get, to, when you get past that, you realise, fuck them, I'm yeah. doing it. Do you know what I mean? So, um, and it's enjoyable and it's fun. And, you know, obviously we don't do it, we don't do it for the va vast kind of swathes of, cash involved, uh, that's that's not the motivation at all, so it's it, we do it because it's fun, I presume the other bands, some of whom are probably making a bit more money than we are in mm -hmm. fairness, but you know I presume that's not the sole motivating factor, I think they do it because it validates what they what mm -hmm. they did when they were younger, mm -hmm. and that's that's fair, that's just as fair as doing it when you're young yeah. I think. Um, and also people enjoy it. Yeah, exactly, if people are paying and enjoying it, you know, it's not like we're, you know, them in yeah, you know, pe people are turning up and they seem to, they seem to by and large think it's think it's 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 enjoyable and a good night out and that's great and we're very grateful for it. Um, as for the yeah the, the, the downturn and whether it will have some similar result in music, I think people are genuinely kind of better off in a general sense. You know, in a general yeah. sense, I mean, I know there's still a lot of problems, but you know, I think this you know the back in the nineteen seventies, uh, early eighties when I was a teenager, I remember it was. Ah, there's really, really grim. I don't like, you know, by and large, it's not quite as grim no, we're today not as we're it not was power anymore. And there's different, yeah, there's different entertainments now as well. You know, yeah. there's there's all these new technologies that just didn't exist back then. And the music, you know, culturally itself is much more fragmented now than it was then. Mm -hmm. So everything is very much different. But I think across, in a cross-cultural sense, I think it is a healthy thing for people, for young creative people. They express themselves, you know, and if that if that happens, they take the form of expressing how frustrated or angry they are, then that's that's a good that's mm -hmm. that's a good valid thing. And I think, yeah, I mean, inevitably, I think you will see that, but it's not. There's just more outlets for it now, and mm -hmm. you know, there's there's more there's more going on now than there was back in the day. Also, purely from the music point of view, there's no you can't really surprise people. You can't sort of no. surprise the music industry now the way punk did mm -hmm. because they've seen so much of it and because they're ready for anything and although the, the music industry is a own device well I know but you know what I mean yeah, it's, yeah. Not like, it's not like you're, you're not really going to get a no. generation gap the way you did with punk no. you know no. when, when 22 year olds were sort of saying I have punk that's rubbish they can't even play you know mm -hmm. particularly when we won't go away yeah that's right yeah. <laughs> is there any new bands that, out there that impress you at the moment there's a great band from Northern Ireland Called Cashier Number Nine. Yeah, great. They are very good. Yeah. Great single produced by David Holmes. Yeah, 
which is out at the minute. It's called uh, Gold Star. It's really, really good. Uh, I do a radio show back in Dublin, and um, I played that single a lot. And they came in and did a session for me. They've got some really good songs. Really nice lads as well. Um, I really like, uh, but staying with Ireland, I really like a band called The Minutes, who uh, are a three-piece out of Dublin, who do a very kind of straight-ahead rock and roll thing, but they've been kind of taking their cues from a lot of a lot of the same sort of uh, places that, the, that a lot of the same influences that the undertones had, you know, like Nuggets and, and kind of the MC5 and stuff like that. Well, that's what I was going to ask, who were the musical influences on the undertones when oh, you were growing up? The Ramones, surely, must be there. T-Rex, there's uh, yeah. an odd to T-Rex in top 20, isn't there? <coughs> T-Rex, yeah, T-Rex, oh God, what's about it? T-Rex, uh, yeah, we did, whenever we were playing the Casper, about 77, we, we sort of went back to glam a lot mm -hmm. from, which is, you know, it seemed a long time before, but it was actually yeah, three years before, you know, 73, 74. And we did, we did a lot of Gary Glitter songs, uh, Glitter Band and uh, T-Rex. Um, what else did we do from that? We, we, we attempted Slade, but we, it was too hard. It was too difficult to do, you know. Yeah. Uh, then that, but that, that kind of coincided with punk, which, and it was, it was the same kind of ethos, you know, the same, it was, it, it was a natural kind of thing to, to do glam stuff and to do punk stuff. And then we looked even further back to the Nuggets, LP which we had, so we did a lot of sixties garage band stuff, and then you did the, you did the which everybody was doing. You everybody was doing the Stitches yeah. and the MC Five and the New York Dolls. It was great, you know. That, that's it. punk came almost ready made. That if you decided to become a punk band, you know, you you had the template there. Mm -hmm. All you had to do was read the NME, read about oh New York Dolls. That's the New York Dolls record, and that's that's learn personality crisis. Yeah, which is great. And it was all so neat and tidy. Mm. You know, you only had about four or five real influences. Now, if a band starts now, you have the last 40, 50 years of stuff. But then, you, it was great because you knew, well, you, we didn't like Pink Floyd, we didn't like Led Zeppelin. It was great. You knew who you didn't like. Yeah. You knew who your enemies were. And you also knew who, <laughs> who the bands that you liked. It's a, it helps define you, what, what you're against as opposed to what you're for. It's just, yeah, I think it's actually a more legitimate Mm. Kind of way looking at it, they should bring back that now. Bring back hatred of bands. It's a lot of picking with your boys and Justin Bieber. Honestly, well, yeah, but that was that. They're the easy targets. But you know, know probably bands now that hate. I, I, I love bands now that hate Radiohead. I, 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 the <laughs> vaccines and and you know the vaccines they get in the fight with uh, I don't know strokes or something. Aye, they're the strokes are out of farts. Aye, do you know what I mean? But you don't get that. You know, you don't you don't see that. There's too much respect for old bands these days. <laughs> What's that all about? It should be stamped out. <laughs> but I used to love it. It used to be great reading. Well, I mean, when, you, when we used to have proper music journalism, of course, that's becoming a thing of the past as well. But, um, you know, I used to love reading in the NME or even Smash Hits, these grudge matches between bands, which used to be hilarious. In fact, one of the reasons I, I, I don't really particularly care for any of the music Oasis or Liam Geller has made probably for the last 15 years. Um, but. I love reading interviews with Noel and Liam Gallagher because they're really funny mm -hmm. and they slag people off yeah. and they'll have a go and they do it in a very entertaining way. It's not just we're wankers, it's just funny. Like what, what Noel Gallagher said about uh, Jack White just had me laughing for a week. What did he say? He said... Um, what did he say, Paul? He said, <laughs> he's, going around, he said he's going around calling himself the poster boy for the alternative generation and then he's doing James Bond themes and Coca-Cola ads. <laughs> Give me a fucking break. He said... <laughs> And not only that, not only that, he looks like Zorro on donuts. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. That's quality. Yes. Yeah. More of that yeah. is what it's about. Instead of everybody going, now oh, everybody likes everybody. That's poor. Mm. Top yeah. quality vitriol. That's right. always good. As long as it's funny, and as long as you know, it's you know, it's it's only rock and roll. But yeah. it's not that you don't mean it, but you mean it out of your passion for what you do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, great. John Peel, obviously we've got to mention him, mm -hmm. huge part of your early career, a uh, whole world of music owes him a huge debt mm -hmm. for everything he did. Would you say he was the MySpace of his day? Wow. Because no. that... No. No. It's a good answer, isn't it? No. Yeah, <laughs> it's a good answer. <laughs> because I don't... Well, MySpace is gone, isn't it, really? It's, well, it's Was he the Facebook of his day? No. Uh, I don't think in, so. in terms of just championing new bands and getting airplay. Um, oh yeah, but it was a completely different time. He had he had the whole field to himself almost because none of the other Radio One yeah. DJs at the time had a clue what was happening. Well, Peter was quite upfront about that mm. as well. He would say, you know, and I think I'm quoting him 
misquoting them, but I know he, he said something along the lines of I play this music because if I don't, nobody else will. Mm -hmm. um, which was a great and you know noble thing for anybody to be doing, but particularly, yeah, I mean, in the, the adversity that it really he was, I think I'm correct in saying encountering at Radio 1, especially towards the end of his career, and I thought, that, I think there was something a little distasteful actually about the whole John Peel industry that kicked in shortly after his death. I mean, I don't want to mm. say anything out of line, but, you know, as far as I understood it, John Peel was having quite an adversarial relationship with Radio 1 mm. uh, towards the end of his life, and... Um, but I think he was probably doing that the whole way through. Yeah, possibly, yeah. yeah. Right. But then, when, then, as is often the case, you know, somebody dies and it's like, oh, God, he's won't, you know. Um, having said that, if he hadn't been having that kind of relationship or having that kind of, uh, mm. would it have been the same thing? Mm. Or, or would it, be, you know, so it's, it's hard to know. You see, it was the, you have to think, you have to remember at the time, yeah, that was the only way you'd hear music. You know, yeah. because you mentioned MySpace, there was no, obviously, there was no internet. There was no other way to, to, to hear uh, obscure punk records, no. other than John P. You couldn't even buy them. Mm. No. Yeah. You got to put your radio on at night. Yeah, it's it's a, your bedroom yeah. And you could read about them in the NME, and you could hear them in John P. And that was it. And if you missed it, unless you taped it, you know, if, you, if you missed it, that you, was it. you missed it. Yeah. And then when you could buy them, it was the only place you'd hear them before. Do you know whether you wanted to buy them? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So it was all bad for me, like the Smiths in the Fall and the Bunny Men and the uh, Half Man Half Biscuit. And, oh God, the list. The list of, local band. Yeah, I could literally sit here all night naming bands that um, I, I only got to hear, well, I only, Pixies, you know, I only I only got to decide whether or not I liked them because Pete played them. This is before the whole ascendancy of the Steve Lamack, Joe Wiley mm -hmm. crap. Um, but you, you think. <laughs> you know, John Peel was kind of where, where, he, where he went. Yeah, and I mean, as I say, if he, maybe if he hadn't been kind of ring fenced off in that little uh, outpost that he was in, maybe it wouldn't have been the same story, so who knows? Yeah, it was also very funny. Too. Yeah, I yeah. I got the, the uh, you know the book of his writing, the Olivetti Chronicles. I got that from Christmas. Mm. It's just so good. All the the articles he showed, even when he was writing for Sounds in the seventies, as well as all the Radio Times stuff. He's just so funny. Very very funny. A very funny man, and uh, and 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 irreplaceable, and uh, as has been proven. You know, Zane Lowe. Sorry. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> yeah, you you can't replace Phil. No. And. No, should you? Do you think the new media embraces the ethos of punk at all? In that anyone can just get their music out there? Yeah. Uh, it's great. There's no, you know, the whole Paul Mason Dairy little thing about the record industry being on its knees. That's great. You know? Mm -hmm. you, you, you have a band now, and if you, if you get, get your songs together, and if you, if you, you can record it in, in the house. Put it out and everyone will get it. You know. yeah. Probably, the problem with that though is that there's an awful lot of rubbish out there. Well, yeah, there's, there's no quality control, is there? Probably not, you know, but you know. You, but then there wasn't much punk. Yeah, you don't have to listen to it. There are, that's a very good point. A lot of a lot of those punk. I, mean, I, I don't want to speak for Mickey, but I mean, as far as I know from the time of, the, of, of Teenage Kicks, the, the, the whole objective was just to get the seven inch piece of mm -hmm. final out. Mm -hmm. That was it. That, yeah. There was no plan beyond that. And that was obviously uh, very much in tune with the, the punk ethos. But yeah, I mean, a lot of it's forgotten and rightly so. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But, and I think it's the same with, you know, the, 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 the kind of, the, the, this whole SoundCloud and Bandcamp kind of thing you know, that's going on. I mean, it's great. It's great that, mm -hmm. that the means are available um, and that so many young people want to get together in groups and make this music or even on their own. Uh, but yeah. There's more of it, which means there's more bad music. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a good thing. It's a healthy thing. Uh, how sustainable it is, I think, long term. I don't know. I think the industry, for want of a better word, always eventually finds a way of Winning. getting on top of the yeah. thing. You know. So, you know, for now, for now, the the, the, the ball is for pretty much in the court of of yeah, you know just people doing it for themselves or whatever, but I don't think it's going to stay like that. They'll find a way. Yeah, but the, the good thing about it is that bands now make records because they want, want to make records. Most bands, yeah. you know, do. They, they realise that there's no, there's not going to be a career in it for them, you know. A lot of guys make records and then they get on with the rest of their life, you know. Which is right. good. Yeah. So, as it should be, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, there's no, I mean, there was a time in Ireland, digress slightly, but anyway. You've got an editing facility, I'm sure. <laughs> um, there was a time in Ireland, in the, you know, after U2 became like enormous, when all the major record companies just decamped, literally just went to Dublin, 
and signed the most appalling bands mm. you've ever heard uh, for huge obscene sums of money, you know, and it was just an awful time, you know. So I, I, I'm glad to see the back of that. I mean, yeah. that's never going to happen again, I don't think. And thank God. Yeah. You know? But it was record company investment that led to the Celtic Tiger. <laughs> it's all those record companies coming over that started I'm, the boom in Ireland. I'm just jealous because I didn't get signed. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got a famous song featuring a popular confectionery, confectionery item. Uh -huh. um, did the brand ever use the track in any adverts? And if not, had you been approached, would you have said yes? Was, oh, it, yes. was it one of John's tracks? It's, no, it was myself and Damien. Right. So that's, a definite, that's a definite yes. Yes. Yeah. We <laughs> would, yeah, we would sell it for anything. We would sell it for 50 pence. Um, no, we never did, but I don't think we ever ran after Mars saying, please use our song. The nearest we ever got was whenever we played somewhere in London and a couple of guys turned up from the Mars factory and they brought a bag which didn't contain money, it contained Mars bars and other Milky Ways and so on, you know, and that was a bit the height of Other rival products. Well, yeah, but it was, uh, no, we didn't get any, any money at all from it. I remember we did a gig of the in the <laughs> Dolan's in Limerick, great venue, brilliant venue in Limerick, run by a, a, a wonderful chap, uh, Mick Dolan, I believe his name is. Um, and uh, we played there a few times, and one of the times, um, they, 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 had no, they had no dressing rooms in the building, or the dressing rooms they had in the building were very, very small and cramped, so we actually had a, a, a house across the road um, that were effectively the dressing rooms, so it was great. Right, right. And we went across the road, and it's house to yourself, magic, you know, and the kitchen, the writer was in the kitchen, and all the stuff around, you know, all the usual stuff. And um, uh, I'm not alluding to anything there by usual stuff, by the way, I just want to make that clear. Um, and there was this box, like a, a, like a, 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 a wholesale pack of Mars bars. And we just took them. We, we, we just, Mars bars, brilliant. We didn't even put these on the writer. Fantastic. How many do you want, Billy? I'll have 10. Go on then. Here we, we took all the Mars bars. And after the show, your man Dolan was appalled because he put the Mars bars in the room, we were supposed to grab a handful each and throw them in the building. <laughs> <laughs> because anyway, uh, he said, what did you do with Mars bars? Talk about my head, three. <laughs> but that would have been, that would have been insane because I actually got hit in the eye one night with a guy with a Mars bar, you know. <laughs> Luckily, he'd been waiting all night, he threw it. It was a bit so soft. It was a bit soft. <laughs> this is probably didn't write a song about Heinz Big. <laughs> <laughs> Can't have been bouncing off your head. <laughs> Don't give them any ideas. <laughs> okay, we're nearly finished now. Teenage Kicks, obviously, mm -hmm. it's, it's one of John's tracks, isn't mm -hmm. it? Cited as the best pop song ever written, spawned at least 43 cover versions to date. 43? That's how many I've counted on your website. Oh and you ask people to keep sending you more. I listened to one last night by New Bell Oh, aye, that's a yeah. lovely one. Beautiful it's a good one, yeah. Very good. Lots of other job, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, is this legacy a golden goose or a poison chalice or a bittersweet mixture of the two? It's, I would say a golden goose. I said a golden goose for John because <laughs> John doesn't. He's not, I'm not saying he's rich, but John, John uh, makes a living from it, you know. Mm -hmm. John uh, hasn't got a day job, he doesn't need one. Uh, no, it's great to have Teenage Kings. Absolutely yeah. brilliant to have Teenage Kings because it is a great record. Even I can spot that, you know, when yeah. I, I play it on. It's a great record and um, people like it. John Pete's favourite record. Can't beat that, you know. No, you can't get higher than that. Although, if, if the Pope had come out and said it was his best favorite record, too, it would have helped him. The Pope. Well, give him time. <laughs> the German Pope, yeah. He's... Someday a Pope will say that. One day a Pope will pronounce Teenage Kiss to be good. It's in the Book of Revelations. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, yeah, it's great. And I think if you the measure of Teenage Kicks is really if you take it up. If you take Teenage Kicks out of the picture, it, it does, it, you know, you, you, there's a big gap there in the whole thing, do you know what I mean? It's very much at the core of of, of the popularity of the band and... Um, and I, really, mean, I, I know what you mean though, some people do kind of, some people kind of resent having a, a big song that overshadows That you've always the rest of it. You've got But as play. Damien and I always remind John, Teenage Kicks only got to number 31. My perfect also got to number nine. <laughs> it's a proper top ten record. In the days when top ten records meant, meant something. And popes will pogo to it? Yes. <laughs> Future popes will no, pogo to it. Great, great record. It is a fantastic track. Well, I asked my, I've got one more question and then I've got a couple of fan questions for you. And then... Jesus, we're on at nine o'clock. <laughs> <laughs>
That's what the court pass says. What does the you future know? hold? And the end of the zones. Uh, the future? Yeah. Uh, future. I know you're off to California, aren't you? We will meet a tall, dark stranger. That's our future. And we will have great success, but there will be tragedy as well. Oh, brilliant. I read this and make tea leaves. Yeah, Stop reading them tea leaves. Is there any no. albums in the office? Yes. yes. We've got, we're working on We're working on it. <laughs> it's a bit like hypnotised. We've run the songs. John has a John will play the song, but we. We demo them and then John says, I didn't like something. So John has been cutting, cutting down stuff, you know. But I think it's about four or five songs. I don't know, it's, it's, it's difficult to kind of get a, a momentum going because, you know, we all, we all do different things, which speaks pretty much to the fact that John has written all the songs. Um, so, you know, I think it's, it's, it's harder. And like the last two records took ages. Put together. I mean, it just took took forever, especially the, the one before the last one took like a long, long time. So I think we just have to accept that's just the way it's going to be. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a bit of a trickle, and then we go through little bursts and spurts of, of creativity or whatever. But I would think, with a fair wind <laughs> and, a, and a good heart, and a good heart, yeah. um, which is hard to find, we would uh, apparently so. <laughs> I thought that was yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, we would be hopefully having having a new record out next year, but we're we're a long way off. We're a long way from shore, as we are. Yeah. Right, well, we look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Fans um, questions. A couple of very quick fans questions, because I appreciate you want to eat, you want to get on. Um, what's been your most memorable gig you've ever played and why? Probably for you when you jumped out of the car and ran straight on the stage. <laughs> yeah, for all the wrong reasons. Um, would it be this space for you, Mickey, or previous? I don't know, I think this space. Oh, yeah. How did the clash in the States all this time? No, because we were sporting the class and nobody used, nobody liked this. Mm -hmm. You know, they were God, hey, who are you goddamn guys? Get off, we want the class. Uh, no, they, we did the electric picnic, big festival in Ireland a couple of years ago, and I really enjoyed that because it was 45 minutes. And I, I do the set lists, and I was told it's to be 45 minutes, and I can't, have, I actually timed the songs. And we came in a minute under. So, it's fun. Why does that give me joy? I don't know. Yeah. No, I like that. Mm -hmm. I like that. Also, I like that because we were camping. I had, I had the children. Right? Oh, the electric picnic. We were all camping. It was great crack, you know. We had yeah. burgers. The electric picnic's a fantastic uh, festival. I don't know if you guys have ever been over. It's, no, it's, it's uh, very, very. It's really, really good. It's not like um, it's it's not it's not huge. Do you know what I mean? It's like about thirty thousand people, so it's it's kind of medium sized festival. But it's just really they just do it so well. It's just a really nice weekend, really relaxing in a weird kind of way for yeah. for for a rock and roll weekend. Yeah, that would be one of my favorites. Also, obviously. The, the initial gigs at the Nerve Centre have, have kind of stuck in my head. Um, I, That's why I enjoyed We played Southampton last week and I really enjoyed it. Yeah. It was, uh, this tour, in fact, so far I has, been, has been really, really good. It's been uh, really enjoyable. We've had great fun. We've had good crowds who've been up for it. And um, yeah, it's been, a, it's, it's been very, very enjoyable this time out now. I have to say I've, I've had a great night, or a great, a great night, a great time so far. Every night's been a great night. So. They're all good. What was Robert saying that I've had a great night? I've had a great night. Because I haven't had the night yet. All right. Okay. Which Later one, I which, can which say which I've had a great night. That? By the time this is published, you will have had a great night. <laughs> <laughs> that night I was talking about, it was great. That's my <laughs> personal promise to you, Paul. Tonight, it shall be a great night. Can I have it in writing, sir? Now, another fan question. John Peel famously has a couple of lines from Teenage Kicks. This is Epitaph. Mm -hmm. What song, if any, would you think fitting for yours? I've got a cousin called Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> I said that once to him, actually. Whatever they're saying. You're a Johnson, John Pitts. I know John Pitts. Headstone says, I've got a cousin called Kevin. He sure could. Uh, what man? Uh, what? Uh, so, Lights in the song? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Exactly. Jimi Hendrix, Excuse Me While I Kiss the Sky. Excuse Me While I Kiss the Sky. I, I quite like that one. That's a good one. Is that yeah. a purple haze, I think? Y yes, it is. It's a good question. Obviously, we're thinking of the joke on her, mate. Yeah, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Think of the good line. I never done good things. I never done bad things. I never done anything out of the blue. Oh, that's oh, good. good. Mm -hmm. I like that. That's a good one. And you've got to have Bowie in there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. My answer would be I never done good things. I never, <laughs> <laughs> I never done anything out of the blue. What would be mine? What would yours be, Pop? Don't laugh at me because I'm a fool. <laughs> And one final question from a fan. 
Um, what's your personal favourite undertones track and why? I think I know what you're going to say. Oh, what? I think, I what think I was, <laughs> you're the one that you reference. <laughs> <laughs> the one that I wrote. My favourite undertone song. That's not my favourite because my favourite undertone song this week is. Yeah, my perfect cousin's great. <laughs> you bastard. <laughs> so it is. My perfect cousin's great. It is great. Yeah, it is good. He thinks that I'm a cabbage because I hate university, university challenge. challenge. I actually like university challenge. Hates cabbage though. Yeah, you do, but there's the irony. But I do think I'm a cabbage. Nah, Mickey. And what about you, Paul? Um, I, my, oh, my favourite is Julie Ocean. Always has been. Yeah, that's my yeah. line. Yeah, I love, I love that song. I love it. I, I actually love it because it does stand out a wee bit in, in the undertones thing, but it's actually very like, um, it's kind of like a Velvet Underground kind of song. Yeah. And, and you know, it, and it kind of, it just reminds me of a certain time mm -hmm. as well when I was, you know, 1981, I was 14 years old or whatever when it came out and I kind of was starting to, you know, get a slightly more formed worldview and whatever you know and just you know you're always nostalgic for, mm -hmm. for things when you were around that age so that was that was the undertones that was the undertone song that was out around then so yeah that's that would be my my favorite and uh cruelly overlooked by the record buying public but there you go a lot of the best records yeah. always were you know so yeah my favorite is julie Ocean too <laughs> <laughs> well i'd like to thank you both very much thank you you're very today. well Oh, it's been very, oh, it's been our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, and have a great night tonight. And good luck with the rest of the tour. Cheers. Thanks, mate. Spot on. Excellent. Absolutely awesome. It's my 12th time I've seen the undertones and each time they get better and better. Really? Debating whether to go to see Manchester tomorrow night. Yeah, I've seen them. First time I saw them in the 80s with Fergal Sharkey, 1980. But awesome. Be better and better and better. Oh, excellent. Excellent. They played everything you wanted to hear. Yeah? Yeah. What was the what was the big trucks that went down well with the crowd? Oh, tonight? they were just... Oh, Jimmy Jimmy. Oh, my goodness. What else? What else went down? Brilliant. Ah, everything went... Right? Teenage Cakes was fantastic. Yeah, John was watching. Yeah. <laughs> well, what are we going to give it out of 10? Ten? Ten, 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 ten out of ten. Ten, ten out of ten. Fantastic. How's it? Okay, so um, brilliant, fantastic. That's what. That's all we can ask for, isn't Absol it? Really? Absolutely. Yeah. Can't beat that. Would you?